Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Jonathan Zeitlin. I'm the uh, academic director of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, which is uh, sponsoring this, uh, this seminar on next generation EU and European financial integration. <laughs> We're really delighted to welcome uh, Nicolas Veron, our lead speaker, uh, back to Amsterdam. We were just complaining that uh, we can't have him here physically, but uh, maybe next year in Amsterdam. Um, I think that uh, Nicola does not need a lot of uh, introduction to this audience, but I will give him uh, a bit. Uh, anyway, he's one of the co-founders of the uh, economic think tank uh, Bruegel uh, in Brussels. He's also uh, a senior fellow of the Peterson Institute for uh, International Economics in Washington, DC. I think he's coming to us from uh, Washington. He writes very broadly about uh, finance, uh, financial services and regulation uh, globally, but especially uh, in Europe. Uh, he's also worked um, both in the French government and in the, uh, in the private sector. He, uh, he publishes very widely, both in the kind of uh, gray literature of think tanks, but also uh, in the academic uh, literature. And I, I think there's probably nobody who has a better claim to have invented the term banking union than Nicola. So it's great to have him here to talk to us about the implications of the, the latest developments uh, next generation uh, EU uh, for the, the uh, banking union and capital market uh, union project. And we're also very happy to have our, our distinguished colleague, Enrico Pierotti, um, who is the professor of international finance here at the University of Amsterdam. He's also a, a member of the advisory scientific committee of the European Systemic uh, Risk Board. Uh, he publishes very widely on banking, corporate finance, on organization theory, on political economy and legal uh, and financial history. He's been a research fellow at the Bank of England and at the, uh, the ECB. Uh, he's also a fellow of the European Economic Association and uh, research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research uh, and the Tinberg and, uh, Institute. He's, uh, had a number of distinguished visiting appointments uh, and also is a consultant, has been a consultant to many of the major IFIs. And so we're very happy, uh, Enrico, that you're with us also uh, to kick off the discussion and comment on Nicola's talk. So um, the format will be Nicola will talk for 20, maybe 25 minutes. He has some slides to show us, then Enrico will respond. Maybe there'll be a quick exchange and then we can have a Q&A with you, the audience. And I see lots of uh, friends and colleagues from around uh, Europe, which is great. Um, and we should be able actually to, um, uh, to let you talk uh, in person. So what I would ask you to do is uh, when you want to talk, um, put your virtual hand up in the um, in the participants window uh, or send me a chat message, but uh, probably the best is to put your virtual uh, hand up. And you can also write questions in, in the chat uh, if you want, but uh, I will have to try to coordinate among all of these things. Okay, Nicola, why don't you share your screen and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and thanks, uh, especially also to Enrico for uh, being the other speaker today. Enrico and I go back a very long way, um, and uh, and this uh, revise my nostalgia for Amsterdam, um, so I can at least. Uh, I think we're all going crazy with lockdown, right? So I can imagine I'm in Amsterdam, and uh, and have this kind of uh, uh, mild moment of madness which is actually pretty pleasant. Um, I didn't invent the expression banking union. It actually has a Dutch origin. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the story is that I was writing about banking federalism back in 2011 and Martin Verwey, uh, who, as you know, uh, was, I think 
he was recently, um, he had recently joined the European Commission by then, but the previous years he was in the Dutch Ministry of Finance. And he said, I was at the conference the other day, I heard a guy say banking unions, that's much better than banking federalism. And I said, yeah, you're right, I will use that in the future. And then I think it's fair to say that, you know, I and other Bruegel uh, colleagues who then, picked, who then picked it up, popularized the, 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 the term, but we, we still don't know who was the guy at the conference. Martin doesn't remember, and I haven't been able to uh, identify uh, it uh, or him. Uh, on Google search or anything. So, so there's an anonymous father for banking union, but if anybody holds a claim, that's Martin more than me. Anyway, um, next generation EU, I'll try to, because uh, as, you, as you mentioned, there are many uh, great experts in the audience. I'll, tr I'll try to be crisp and succinct. Uh, generally, this kind of promise leads nowhere, but I'll do my best. Um, and indeed, I think next generation EU is, um, a game changer for the whole discussion about European financial integration. I think it's it's useful to remember what happened in the past decade, and a lot of things happened. So banking union was decided in June 2012 uh, and came into force gradually uh, with uh, a number of missing pieces, uh, particularly on deposit insurance, where the proposals that the commission published in November 2015 went exactly nowhere. Uh, so the European Commission is now consulting again on, uh, on, on crisis management and deposit insurance and will probably publish a new proposal uh, somewhere uh, later this year or early next year. I'll come back to this. Capital Markets Union was launched as a rhetorical project by Jean-Claude Juncker in his maiden policy speech in July 2014, the day he was elected by the European Parliament. So then, when that's when the expression was uh, was initiated, and I and I and I think two things can be said about the context, which may be familiar to all the audience or maybe not. One is that this was well, not explicitly, but very ostensibly a UK-oriented project. So this was a way to make the UK feel good about EU policy because Capital Markets Union was framed by Juncker as a very London-friendly, city-friendly um, endeavor. And specifically, all the issues that were potentially contentious with London, of which there were several, were taken out of the project under the leadership of Jonathan Hill, who was service, financial services commissioner immediately afterward. The other, the other point is that Obviously, the naming of the Capital Markets Union was intended as an echo to the banking union. Uh, and, um, and that's because the banking union at the time looked like a pretty good success for EU policy. And so Capital Markets Union was a way to say, well, let's let's uh, build on that success with even more success. Uh, so, so I think this context matters um, to looking back. And of course, next generation EU, I think familiar to this audience, uh, the breakthrough in May last year with Macron and Merkel uh, announcing their joint stance a couple of days after the disruptive uh, Karlsruhe ruling of May 6, if I remember correctly. I think Macron and Merkel were, was May 16 or 18. And in June, the decision in December uh, formalized in the European Council with the mechanism and now being almost certainly ratified by all now that Karlsruhe has not objected. And in the meantime, Debates on the international role of the euro, which have intensified after the rejection of the joint comprehensive plan of action uh, by the Trump administration in May 2018. So where are we? Uh, banking union uh, was intended very explicitly, and I think very aptly, to break the notorious bank sovereign vicious circle. So I think that to me serves as a definition of the banking union. This is the way you break the bank sovereign vicious circle. Um, and as we know, that could be done by fiscal union, but fiscal union is difficult. And therefore the choice was made to go for banking union instead, which I think is a reasonable choice. Um, it's a half completed project. The supervision piece is pretty strong. The crisis management piece is not working as intended. I think this proposition I just made was maybe contentious two or three years ago. It's no longer contentious. I think the consensus has crystallized in the last two years uh, that uh, there is a problem with the ways of crisis management framework, by which I mean, you know, resolution, insolvency, whatever um, works. 
there is no common deposit insurance and importantly uh, the levels of concentrated domestic sovereign exposures have not gone down they actually went up a bit uh, in a number of critical countries with COVID-19 but the big picture is that they're still there uh, and that's a problem in terms of the bank sovereign vicious circle so as I mentioned the European Commission is consulting um, I don't remember if their consultation is now closed or still open if it's still open I encourage all of you to contribute I think it's a good initiative it's particularly good because it breaks one of the damaging silos that had uh, been problematic in this uh, discussion so far which is the silo between deposit insurance and crisis management so very aptly the uh, European Commission consultation is called crisis management and deposit insurance CMDI is a new acronym uh, which I think is very good the one silo that they don't break is the link between that discussion on crisis management and deposit insurance on the one hand and on the other hand the discussion on concentrated sovereign exposures which still remains a bit taboo as far as I can judge from the European Commission's uh, perspective. And that's a problem because if you don't approach those issues uh, holistically, I think it's very unlikely that there will be um, that meaningful progress can be made because the, 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 the give and take and the trade offs are so complicated. It's immensely complicated. I'm sure we'll come back to it. I think it is actually possible to breakthrough and to finish the job but it's not easy it's not easy because of the risk share because a number of other political factors so uh, so 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 that's where we are in banking union capital markets union you know this whole joke in the market that the definition of a long-term investment is a short-term investment that failed so along those lines capital markets union is a long-term uh, policy endeavor I think uh, it is fair to say that the initial push by Juncker and Jonathan Hill has not yielded a lot of results in terms of uh, real policy reform. I mean, the commission has probably, probably you know, uh, 35 different action points on which they have something to show according to their criteria, but uh, it's not been transformational. Uh, and, um, and I think there are, there are really two categories of issues in capital markets union, and I would venture that it's useful to distinguish them. One is about very broad cross-cutting themes like insolvency law and taxation, especially investment taxation. But I would also say pension finance, which has been marginally included in the agenda and housing finance, which has not been included at all. Even so, it's a very structural feature of as a financial and especially the banking system as all of us know and securitization and what have you. Um, so these issues, I would venture are not going to be reformed uh, by the commissioner in charge of financial services. They're intensely political uh, and they're beyond the pay grade of the financial services commissioner or DG FISMA. So uh, I'm not saying nothing will happen in those areas. For example, in taxation, you could imagine if you're in a good mood, a harmonization of investment taxation in a different context, uh, which is a, concept, a discussion of taxation issues, and for example, the fight against tax havens and things like that, um, but not as a matter of building a financial system and uh, a capital markets union. So I think more realistically, and I think that's been a big lesson of the last you know, six, seven years, um, if the commissioner for financial services wants to achieve something, they should basically forget about the cross-cutting themes and, and focus on the core themes that are on their turf, uh, which are essentially supervisory architecture, which boils down to the role and the governance of ESMA. Maybe we'll come back to that, uh, the European Securities and Markets Authority. Uh, issues of auditing, accounting, disclosure, and reporting, which I view as very important, but have been uh, remarkably left out of the capital markets union agenda so far, including the visa report, the high level group that uh, did the next uh, CMU report last year, uh, which has nothing to say about accounting and auditing, which was kind of hilarious when wire cards then uh, erupted. Uh, and the oversight of financial infrastructure, where here again, we have a number of hilarious features, such as the ones that ESMA is the direct supervisor of CCPs, central counterparties, which are uh, important in Europe, but headquartered in a third country, like the UK, uh, but have has basically no role in the supervision of European headquartered CCPs, even the most um, 
critical ones, uh, which really makes absolutely no sense. So, um, so I, I would say, yes, if you want a real capital markets union, well, number one, you need a banking union. Number two, you need you know, stuff about insolvency, taxation, pension for, and housing, but that's um, putting the bar too high. And, and I would say if something has to be achieved, it's probably in the more core business of, uh, of DG FISMA. So essentially, I'm downbeat on capital markets union, and, and I've been slightly downbeat on banking union, at least in the short term, because I see so many obstacles to progress that I think even so, the technical discussion and analytical consensus has made a lot of progress, actually, in the last two, three years, including on the fact that the crisis management framework doesn't work, uh, that doesn't resolve all the political obstacles uh, far from it. So now comes next generation EU. And next generation EU is a game changer in many ways. It reveals the absence of fundamental obstacles against risk sharing. So I would say in terms of revealed preference, that's a major data point. Um, it creates a new reference asset for capital markets, EU bonds, which I for one have no problem calling a euro bond or safe asset, even so I know that many people have problems with that kind of vocabulary. Um, and it potentially reframes a discussion because it creates this reference asset. It, it potentially reframes a discussion about concentrated domestic sovereign exposures because if you have enough EU bonds uh, around or even with some clever financial engineering, you can really have them as a reference high quality liquid assets that banks will hold in their portfolio. And then the whole discussion about concentrated do uh, domestic sovereign exposures, I wouldn't say goes away because you can still imagine having them but is a completely different discussion. Uh, and, um, and so I think this is transformational, but I also believe it will um, take time for the dust to settle, uh, if only because, as we know, at this point, next generation EU is considered a one-off uh, from a legal perspective and also um, in some of the political discourse, not all. Um, so I think a little bit more of a sense of permanence of EU bonds as a feature of the marketplace uh, has to come in before this transformational impact uh, can play out. And also, I mentioned that banking union was in a way a substitute for fiscal union in terms of breaking the bank sovereign vicious circle. So you could make a case that the fact that we have this major step out fiscal union, it's not fiscal union, but it's a ma major step out fiscal union, as I think Olaf Scholz has um, called it, and I think actually so, um, that kind of reduces the pressure to finish the banking union because the likelihood that we would have uh, a revival of the bank sovereign vicious circle is actually sharply decreased by the, what has already been achieved in next generation EU um, space. And actually you see that, for example, uh, most strikingly in Italian bond yields, which have been hovering at or below 100 basis points for uh, a year now, uh, which is quite remarkable and arguably <laughs> maybe below a fair price, pricing of credit risk. I mean, we can discuss. Uh, so, um, so, so, um, so the question is whether there can be any reform energy beyond the implementation of next generation EU. And I, I, my, my view here is that, you know, if it's implemented as intended, that will be good enough uh, from a reformer's point of view. Uh, you tell me if I set the bar too low. So looking ahead, I'm not going to make any forecast because the future is too difficult to know, but I'm going to mention six uh, drivers of change, at least potentially, and that's why I put a question mark on each of them. Um, is there going to be financial fragility induced by COVID-19 uh, in the European banking sector? I think this question has been front and center for people like me and a number of policymakers, obviously, uh, for the last 12, uh, 14 months. And it now looks like the answer is no. So there was a scenario in which COVID-19 would have created the tsunami of NPLs. Enrico, I want you to explain to us why the ESRB has been using that expression two weeks ago, which I think is a little bit of overkill, a tsunami of NPLs. Um, so um, uh, at this point, it looks like you know there will be NPLs, of course, and the current levels of corporate failures is abnormally low. 
but it's probably not going to eat up that much of the bank's capitals that they are thrown into uh, distress and sector level fragility. I mean, maybe we'll have, you know, uh, events with this or that bank and the usual suspects come to mind. But, um, but I think sector wide, it's not, uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be disruptive. So then the next question is consolidation M&A. And I think it's pretty clear that there would be more m if the banking union was complete. Uh, and I think that's now generally a generally accepted argument. The more difficult question is, can there be m and and especially cross-border m and even without completion of the banking union? And my answer to this is a cautious yes. But I think it's over a medium time horizon, uh, rather than very short term. Even so, I know that Credit Agricole is completing the acquisition of uh, Credito Valtellinese in uh, close to Enrico's uh, favorite region, um, but that's not huge, even so it is cross-border. Uh, and um, and so, um, so I think here's a jury is still out, uh, but obviously uh, cross-border banking m and would go a long way potentially if, if it's a big deal uh, to uh, erode the bank's sovereign vicious circle. So then the, there's the obvious question of, you know, will there be a lot of EU bond issuance under a next generation EU or other similar programs. And that's a major driver of the whole uh, mutualization risk sharing. Uh, I mean, it's not technically mutualization, but it's risk sharing um, that, uh, that uh, I've already alluded to. Uh, there are questions about post-Brexit reallocation. It's still early days. There are questions to attitudes to bail-in, which are critical to the reform of the bank crisis management framework. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, uh, most politicians, when they are at the European Parliament, they say, yeah, bail-in is good. But when you look at real politics of it, uh, that's not a generally accepted stance. Uh, and we have had a lot of revealed preference, not only in Italy, but including in Italy uh, over the last few years, particularly in 2017, but also, for example, you know, Nord LB and uh, a number of cases in Germany. And there is actually market discipline if you look at Greensill Bank and all those German municipalities that have... Um, lost all their deposits at, at Greensill, which happened because of a quirk in German law, not to be insured at all, even up to uh, 100,000. Um, but, uh, but, but, but whether, um, I mean, whether the framework can be fixed in a way that makes it bailing credible, uh, I think remains very, very much to be seen. And, and then a, an issue which may be a bit peripheral, but I think far from negligible, is the enlargement of the euro area and of the banking union. As you know, Croatia and Bulgaria are on their way to join both the, uh, to join the euro area. They're already in the banking union. So the banking union is 21 countries now, um, not 19. Um, and, uh, and, and there is a very active debate in Denmark and Sweden and also in Romania. I mean, Romania, I think it will be like Croatia and Romania uh, and Bulgaria. So it will be on their way to the euro. And that's probably not going to happen before, you know, later in this decade, but I think eventually it will happen. And I think, you know, even for Poland, we're only a change of political majority away from a new debate on your adoption. So, uh, so who knows when that may happen. Let me stop here. Um, I've, uh, almost, I've been almost disciplined and I look forward to our um, conversation. Thanks very much again for having me. Okay, great. Um, Nicola, wonderful tour d'horizon of all the, uh, the open, painful, but also a few hopeful uh, areas on the agenda of European financial uh, integration. Let me pass the floor to, uh, to Enrico to uh, react to what Nicola has said. Sorry, I was muted. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. You just want to go to this um, slideshow mode. Yes, that's what I am. Oh, yes, very good. Okay, so um, as expected, uh, there is much that Nicole does bring to the table. So uh, as I anticipated, <clears throat> and as the slide I saw yesterday pointed out, this is a big picture view. I indeed don't need to introduce Nicolas, but I will say 
So Nicola has been since 2010 really a protagonist in this whole debate. And I think what he's always focused on is, I think more than most people has taken the time and attention to focus on understanding the infrastructure that was missing for financial integration and you know figuring out also aspects that were important and technical but technical in account and regulatory standards now there is so much that he has spoken to which is even a multiplication of the many things in this slide and so what i had to choose was to take an angle where i could contribute to the thinking I, let me generally say that I do agree with the thrust of this big picture. And uh, I want to also, I want to focus on one aspect that is, I think, conceptually important to understand, which is what is new about this uh, essentially next new generation. I do agree it's a game changer. As it happens often in Europe, things happen with uh, uh, always with crisis. And I want to point out to what is the very specific thing from a financial economist is essentially the notion that we have now something that we didn't have before. Um, your integration, uh, one of the big issues, the, maybe the biggest issues Nicola has always pursued has been held back by a number of missing uh, components in the infrastructure. One of that was a common safe asset. That is central to some extent in dealing with the Banks over in Doom Loop. And uh, it was held back also from this long resistance to fiscal sharing. Now, we finally have this common fiscal vehicle. It has a scale that is not huge, but not small. And the potential clearly of becoming much more central. And I think what I would like to do is to think a bit conceptually to understand why the impact might be so large. One of the things I'd like to do is to understand why we have it now. I mean, this has been a struggle for 10 years, uh, agony over this issue. And um, there is a sentence in uh, one of uh, Nicola's uh, slides about the fact that we have now revealed the absence of fundamental obstacle against risk sharing. Well, I think there is enormous resistance to risk sharing. On the other hand, there is, it's not so much that we discover it wasn't there. It's been there all the time, it's still there. However, something has happened and I think it's useful to understand why it's happening now because it opens some door possibly going forward. This is where I'm going to be, of course, a bit speculative. So I'm going to just run through the background that Nicholas has pointed to being more the, uh, the sort of more, a uh, bit more focused because there's so much that Nicholas can bring on the table. Um, so I want to review how the EU has always had national markets, which were historically segmented before the Euro especially between core periphery, but even between France and Germany. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, Germany and the Netherlands looked at even France with great suspicion, and it was a struggle at the time of stabilization of this change rate. After the Euro, we had steps in financial integration that were not expected. In fact, what was stunning was the degree of, inter of integration for sovereign debt market, where in the end we had, you know, uh, the Greek government being able to borrow for cents above the boons. And that just says something about, uh, you know, how strongly people took the euro to be a solid thing. On the other hand, you know, besides, besides the sort of safe asset, notional safe asset, the integration was moderate on other dimension. There was a, some integration bank funding, relatively little for capital market, but it was on its way. And then we got a crisis that shook this financial integration progress. And the foundation of any financial crisis, I don't mean asset bubble, but financial crisis, banking crisis, is that some asset is no longer safe. And every time that happens, the system shakes. Shakes in, in, because in a sense, when you hit the ground, or things not being safe in a fundamental way, it's no longer a matter of price people are just not willing to bear any risks. So, so in the EU that brought back the risk of sovereign devaluation uh, uh, risk. And, you know, 
question the issue deposit safety and then we were at the moment of disintegration it was a remarkable how central bank uh, all over the core countries were whispering to sell the italian and uh, spanish bonds there was quick decoupling there was really self-fulfilling potential for euro collapse and the central bank had to intervene and ultimately what they were doing they were sort of restoring a sense of safety into uh, assets that were uncertain in part because of some self-fulfilling component and in part of course because objectively credit risk certainly if the euro had broken so this is where this is why we have a banking union it was you know i spent so much time in the past talking about the idea that europe would have a common bank regulation people said never gonna happen and uh, because it's impossible to get people together to agree certainly not without a crisis and yet it happened exactly because confidence was needed exactly because in a sense you know the issue wasn't really immediately even sovereign default it wasn't going to happen so quickly it was the issue that you know people need safety and people don't hold government debt but they hold deposits and banks bank deposits are safe because they have deposit insurance now who's paying the deposit insurance uh, fund the government so in the end uh there was no escape from the fact that if you want to maintain stability you had to resolve this issue and in the eu system we needed to restore safety in the context because essentially however even when the banking union was completed there was missing detail in the it essentially we didn't have a european safe asset besides the bonds and uh, you know it's a bit absurd to imagine that all banks all over europe should be holding the bonds to prove that they are being safe I never understand why banks should be considered unsafe because they hold their own government debt. I mean, truly, if they if the government defaults, the bank is dead anyway because without deposit insurance, it'll be run completely. So that's a very specific discussion. But let me go really to the, my main point. The financial system is a pyramid. There are very sophisticated markets that make the front page of the time, uh, or risk capital or uh, bank financing. But ultimately, it is built on a pyramid of need. People need safety at the bottom, they need liquidity at the middle, and then they have aspirational uh, chance for investing uh, in risky stuff. But without a foundation, essentially, you don't have financial system uh, i'm sorry for this simplistic framing but it's i find it very useful you know this is drawn from maslow's theory of you know human needs the pyramid of safety then you have more a uh, more sort of well-being and then more aspirational aspect the same thing is true uh for the way in which the system is supported you have demand for safety that can be satisfied by uh, essential deposit government debt and then you can have all the other things building the banking part on top of that and ultimately the capital market um so that's what of course you cannot really talk about capital market union before a lot of stuff is put in place and the key is ultimately a common safe asset of some significance of some liquidity or some representativeness you know we had a major crisis. It was led by uh, an issue of, you know, panic because stuff that was considered safe wasn't I wasn't safe enough. There was scarcity of safe asset. Why didn't we create a common safe asset then? Well, because you know this was financial safety, and uh, in the end, ACB could take on the task. And essentially, I think we all agree that. Many governments, yeah, we, we, Europe couldn't come together at that point to take a, such a major step. The EU stepped in and did the job. Uh, I mean, a lot of creating safety had to do with resolving liquidity risk. Implicitly, there is some background hidden fiscal risk, hidden, but you know, the, it was a successful transition. And so the EU politicians managed not to have a common form of sort of share fiscal responsibility. They could kick 
you can down the alley is the, is the out there. So why do we have a breakdown with COVID? Why was it different? That's kind of what I'd like to think. And here, I want to go back to the notion of the sort of what is the primary need that ultimately can justify something that was initially politically unacceptable for many. COVID was a shock to real safety. I mean, it was, it's a diffuse health issue. There's a ma massive externality issues. It's not something you can delegate to a central bank. It's not a matter of liquidity. It, uh, in response to that, you know, in the early day of the crisis, it was impossible to talk about limiting fiscal spending. There was unconditional desire to provide for safety. And also if only fiscal intervention truly could reach the household that were the one hit. There was so much at stake. There was a border controls. There were really scary discussion going on. Uh, I remember in Italy, people start to talk about the Germans blocking uh, the, the export of vaccine towards Italy. It was a scary time because in those moments, when people are scared, they're going to respond strongly. And so the EU had to be part of the solution or it was going to be the major victim. And I think it's only the risk of Euro disintegration in a way that the central bank couldn't fix was that finally broke the resistance to this symbolic but important uh, change. So I'm going to go speculative here and uh, talk about the fact that the innovation here is that we don't, we don't just create a, a new financial construction, but there is a sort of a real need that this program has seen as addressing. Uh, it's focused on a medical emergency. Uh, it directs spending, so it resolves some of the issue that you have with mutual, with the sort of share fiscal responsibility that it is, you know, you don't want to give money to others and, you know, what's the discipline there. There is a form of directed spending, which is an innovation, and it's actually a federal step or sort, and it might be that it points to a role for the EU in providing some sort of common basic safety that you know, goes beyond. I mean, here, by the way, I think uh, Nicholas is right that to the extent that there is this step taken, uh, there is a, it has given some potential consolidation uh, to Europe, the fact that, you know, however, uh, uh, confuse their response has been, it, ha it has been seen ultimately as also your European response. Perhaps in Europe can find itself on the idea of uh, providing for a common uh, set of safety, but then more real and more directly provide as opposed to delegate. We we'll see exactly how it plays out. I'm just putting out thought. On the financial consequence of this uh, new fund, I mean, there is an immediate direct reintegration of sovereign debt market. Of course, it's a small portion, but you know, it's a bit endogenous how much of a portion this will be, could become large. It is a partial solution to provide banks with safe assets that are not just their own sovereigns. Um, I think the effect would be positive on the banking sector. I don't know if it's major. I think in some sense, the banking sector is a relatively solid position now. Uh, ultimately, we will have some benefit to CMU, but I think there a lot more is needed. I do share some of the, uh, uh, some of the doubt on how easy it's going to be. Um, and here I'm going to speculate further. I understand this is a broad audience and uh, not just economists. I mean, if you look at the direct consequence of COVID uh, and how this is going to uh, play, we just have, we see a striking rise in income inequality because there is, uh, it hits very differentially. I think uh, I can talk for the SRB not formally. I think the general sense that banks are, are peer solid. Uh, they benefited because this was a crisis in which the, the money did not left the bank, but went into the bank, which was uh, what, uh, what the normal recession is. I don't think we had a major crisis, uh, um, although we had some runs on some shadow banks. Uh, 
I think the situation was controllable relatively soon, but there is certainly issues down the line about some specific shadow bank will ultimately be coming there. There is a very delicate political moment now here because the banks are claiming based on the on their model that they have uh, don't have many defaults. There are a lot of moratoria, of course, they're all kind of liquidity injection. Banks say, well, look, uh, we're doing so well, we should be able to pay dividends. And the SRB and, and, uh, and the ECB have pushed hard against that because essentially it is clear that a lot of the losses may not be manifested yet. So this is a classic challenge that under you know, private law, all banks can pay dividends if they satisfy capital requirement, this capital requirement, of course, you know, construct on the base of models and we'll have to see what happens in a year. Uh, but ultimately what I think is uh, indeed, and it's maybe an interesting point here, what I think is a bit out of the picture for now is the U deposit insurance. I'm not sure it should be quite the priority the bankers claim because I do think that there are important issues of fiscal sharing that need to be targeted that I would target ahead of EU deposit insurance. Uh, that's a uh, personal view. I also think that is a bit absurd that the EU demands of um, say Bulgaria that they establish a deposit insurance limit of 100,000 euro. That's an enormous Liab fiscal liability for a country for which this is a very large amount. There are many issues that will need to be dealt with the EU deposit insurance. I mean, I want to just remind you somewhere that there is a background to the notion that safety has some deep foundation, that it comes that you can only have certain degree of higher level of financial development once you satisfy some, some sort of basic safety. All right, so I mean, there are more things I'd like to say, uh, but I think perhaps um, I need to stop now and uh, sort of get more of, the, uh, of an engagement. Um, there's more than Nicolas brought into the discussion um, during the talk, but I'm happy to engage. Thank you. Thanks very much, Enrico. So now, we, now we've had two complimentary talks, both extremely interesting. Nicola, I want to give you a moment to respond to Enrico. Then I have a, a couple of questions for the two of you, and then we'll open up uh, to the audience. So people in the audience can already start putting their hands up or uh, putting messages uh, into the chat. So. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, I have a minor point and, uh, and, and, and a perhaps more important point. The minor point is something uh, Enrico said in passing, which is, you know, I don't see why we talk about concentrated sovereign exposures because it's, if a sovereign default, the, all the banking sector is kaput anyway. Um, I think things are not that clear. And we are seeing actually some rating agencies lifting the uh, ratings cap. Uh, in the Eurozone precisely for that reason. Uh, there are banks which have activities outside of their home country, even with the limited uh, extent of cross-border m and that we've seen in recent years. But more importantly, uh, you mentioned the deposit insurance systems. They are partly self-funded, even so they are ultimately guaranteed by the, the government. So if you assume that there could be a sovereign default without a bank run, which I don't think is that outlandish an assumption, in the Eurozone, perhaps conditional on some further reform, then your proposition ceases to be true. And I think we have learned a lot, especially during the Greek episode, but also other episodes uh, in this department, including, frankly, the stickiness of deposits, for example, in countries like Portugal or others, uh, countries that went into programs. So I think it's just, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying it's just too simplistic. Things are more complicated than that, and we're not that far from uh, the point where banks would actually uh, be able to survive a sovereign credit event, or at least some categories of sovereign credit events in the Eurozone and banking union. So perhaps broader point is about why we had COVID, uh, why we had next generation EU, sorry, last year, which is uh, uh, something that Enrico touched upon. I think it's a combination of at least three things. Uh, the way I, remember it happening, uh, <laughs> uh, even so my memories have been impaired by the general craziness of lockdown. Um, 
One is that because of the nature of this crisis and especially the nature of contagion, of virus contagion, this was a much faster moving event than a normal financial crisis. I mean, we may remember the 2008 financial crisis as fast moving, but when we think of, for example, the banking system, and actually this whole bank sovereign vicious circle, it actually moved pretty slowly. And if you take a linear path, which I think is not absurd, from the high point of financial crisis in September, October 2008, to the, the turmoil in late 11 and creation of banking union in mid 12, it took almost four years. Uh, in the spring of last year, things were moving very fast. And there was a sense that the, the, the shock was so fast and so um, immediate that we could have the dynamic of unraveling with a time constant that was like 10 times quicker than what we had in the previous Eurozone crisis. And I think that that played a huge psychological effect that basically, you know, the, the ECB could buy some time, but really not a lot. And that's what they did. Uh, but there was this enormous time pressure from the, the pace of contagion. The second point, which is quite obvious when you think about it, is just the experience. I think Merkel had gone, <laughs> uh, Merkel, of course, was pivotal here. I don't want to downplay the role of the other leaders. And, you know, if she hadn't gotten through the Eurozone crisis, I'm not sure she would have gone for uh, next generation EU the, the way she did. Actually, I'm pretty sure she wouldn't have. Uh, and the third point was Karlsruhe. I think it's, it is, of course, we'll never know, but it's a plausible proposition that if Karlsruhe hadn't taken their decision in early May to, you know, rock the boat uh, on, um, on the primacy of EU law and all that, Merkel may not have gone for next generation EU. So in a way, you know, be careful what you wish for. So judges in Karlsruhe, may have been uh, the initiators of the greatest advance ever uh, towards fiscal union. I'll stop there for the Q&A. Thanks, uh, Nicola. And Enrico, I'll, I'll give you a chance to come back in in, in a moment, but I, I'd like to pose uh, some uh, some comments for you to, to react to. So if I, if I listen to both of you, um, I think a point on which you, you both um, agree, which is very important, is that a, a critical feature of the next generation EU is that it creates a, a, a form of a European safe asset. And that in turn has two uh, consequences. Um, one, it opens up the possibility, not the necessity, uh, for a, a way to unblock the debate about uh, concentration of, of sovereign uh, assets, uh, because you could use the, uh, the safe asset euro bonds for that purpose, and so that might lead to uh, unblocking some of the uh, the other issues also about uh, completion of banking union. Secondly, uh, because it creates a, a safe asset. It has implications for the interface between uh, the banking system and the, and the capital markets because this safe asset uh, can be used for repo and other uh, transactions. And so it contributes to financial stability and does not lead to the, the classic flight to safety problems that we saw before. Uh, those seem to be the, the, the crucial uh, contributions. I mean, maybe there are there are others of the of the next generation EU to uh, EU uh, financial integration. Now, I wanted to ask, and I guess especially uh, Nicola, about uh, two uh, other points that are uh, that are, are still very salient, and whether uh, you know you think that um, that we will see movement here. So one. Uh, is about ring fencing of capital uh, within the uh, the eurozone. So um, I mean, if an index of um, uh, integra financial integration is cross border lending, we actually have less of this now than before the uh, the euro crisis. Something like eighty six percent of lending is within national borders within the the banking union, and that is partly for reasons to do with the deposit insurance, but it's also partly uh, to do with the remaining um, national options and discretions 
and the, the rights of, of uh, finance ministries to uh, require capital to be kept uh, within uh, cross-border uh, groups. And so there is a question of whether any of this is going to, uh, any of these developments will help uh, here without um, uh, deposit insurance. The uh, ECB has some uh, interesting and creative ideas for addressing this uh, directly in terms of the ways in which uh, risks are measured at the, at the level of cross-border banking groups. And the goal here is to reassure national ministries that those risks are properly uh, covered so that they could relax the, uh, the ring fencing. That is a, a possible approach, but I'm not sure it has anything to do directly with next generation EU. And the other point I wanted to ask you about, uh, Nicola, is the, um, the problems with the crisis management system. I mean, I, I agree that, I, I mean, the consensus you described that there are structural problems with it, I, I would agree with that. Um, you presented it mostly around, uh, do people really accept bailing? Can bailing work or are the key actors willing to accept it? But um, there is also the problem that we, in essence, have four different uh, sets of criteria or standards uh, for bank resolution, bank intervention. We have the early intervention criteria uh, of the, uh, uh, the single supervisory mechanism. We have the criteria of the European uh, Resolution Board of when it is in the European public interest to resolve a bank. We have the criteria under national insolvency laws. And then we have the criteria of the European Commission about when state aid is permitted. And these, um, as the, the Italian cases, uh, showed or can be in conflict uh, with one another. It's certainly strange that it can, the European Resolution Board can decide that it's not in the European public interest to resolve a bank because it's not systemically important, but then uh, the Italian authorities and the European Commission can uh, accept that it is at least from within Italy systemically important uh, to uh, not to allow a, a bank simply to, to go bankrupt. Um, so maybe you can comment about um, where are we going with the, uh, the crisis uh, management system and whether anything in the um, next generation EU uh, will help there. So thank you, uh, Jonathan. These are very comprehensive questions that you um, asked. And there is absolutely nothing about banking in next generation EU. And that's not a bug, it's a feature because negotiators of bank in next generation EU figured out, I think rightly, that banking is very contentious and politically toxic and that they know that banking is kind of, you know, one of the big piece of where the EU framework has to introduce risk sharing but they wouldn't do it in that round. So if you look at the next generation EU package, there is not even what would have been very reasonable, like something to say, you know, if it turns out that the COVID-19 shock results in financial fragility in the banking sector, which I think was a distinct possibility back in July last year, even so, as I argued, I think it's less of a plausible scenario right now, which is good news. Um, but they didn't do that. They didn't say, well, if it turns out that the banking sector is a bit fragile, then next generation EU fund could, you know, serve like, you know, um, recapitalize some problem banks or things like that, which would have been eminently reasonable. But that would have been a deal breaker. Uh, so, um, so if your question is, you know, is there something in next generation EU about ring fencing or resolution or deposit insurance or uh, indeed... Uh, a precautionary recapitalization, which I think would have been exhibit one, uh, if you ask me, um, or, you know, bad banks or what have you. The answer is no, and that's on purpose. Um, that was a condition for next generation EU to happen at all. And I think that was very wise. Now, what next generation EU, as I tried to argue, 
demonstrates is that when there's a problem that's big enough, member states are willing to share risk. And that's huge, and that has read across on banking, including deposit insurance, bad bank, precautionary capitalization, and you name it. But that's my inference. It's not in the fine print. I think it's a market's inference as well. Uh, and that's why I think it's transformational, but you won't find any piece of the fine print that says that. Now, on your questions about risk fencing and resolution, I mean, we would need another hour for that. Basically, my point, and I, I, I should have mentioned risk fencing and resolution criteria and state aid and blah, 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 um, is that you know, you're not going to fix this problem of completing the banking union by just hitting one piece of it. You have to look at the whole big greasy bowl of problems, and that includes all the ones you mentioned, the ones I mentioned, plus more. I would still posit that the reluctance against bail-in is central to all of this, including what you said about the discrepancies between the different regimes, uh, you know, resolution, public interest, insolvency, state aid. Uh, ultimately, the question was, you know, how much money can the Italian taxpayer uh, uh, throw at uh, the Veneto banks uh, to minimize the pain to credit creditors of those banks? Uh, so, um, so let, let me stop there because I, really it would be too long to answer your questions on substance. I, my, my point is just a very simple one. Unless you take all these issues together, including concentrated sovereign exposures, not just crisis management and deposit insurance, it's unlikely in my views that you're going to fix the issues. If you're interested in my views on uh, crisis management, insolvency, state aid, etc., uh, I refer you to the paper we did together with Anna Gelpern for the European Parliament in 2019. Uh, we're looking at the FDIC experience in the US and the lessons possibly for, from there for EU reform. And we went in a lot of detail into all of these issues. So thanks, um, Nicola. You're just giving us another reason to bring you back to Amsterdam to discuss these issues. Uh, Enrico, do you want to add anything uh, briefly before we open up to the audience? We have a couple of questions already in the chat. Yes, so I'll be short. So for, uh, I do agree on with uh, Nicolas about some of the reason that things happen in this crisis it didn't happen before. The, so, but circumstantial issue, certainly the European leaders learned a lot from the past. It was a very important issue of contagion. However, you know, it is true that this intervention has nothing to do with bank union. And that confirms that it wasn't really a financial crisis issue. This was a political issue. It was, it was really real scare. And the real scare is different than the financial scare. So I think that was what made a difference. Anyway, we will never be able to fully know. Um, I just have a, another quick comment on, on, um, on resolution. So I think resolution will always bound to be messy. And I want to make a point. Um, if, you, if you do banking history, you look how banks were resolved. Time and again, there were ugly things, but no one noticed anything. You know, banks were... Bankrupt banks were given for, they were cleaned up of public expense and given up to competitors, uh, concentrated market shares. There was all kind of stuff hidden. And, you know, if I look at, I'm a Dutch taxpayer, I can tell you that the Dutch, just before the law was passed, made a disgraceful uh, uh, sort of a, um, a buy, paying back of debt that they didn't have to pay back for an SNS bank. Um, you know, it cost a billion. And when I ask around why we were doing, people say, well, you know, otherwise the cost of funding for Dutch banks would go up. And you say, well, why would I care? I'm a taxpayer. So frankly, it is always, always messy. The, I think the problem with the Italian banks have to do with the fact that the crisis took longer or maybe losses were hidden longer. So you see all this stuff flying in Italy and uh, Portugal, but it was messy before. So I think it's a bit of a hopeless thing to expect things to work cleanly. Also, let me add one more point, and this is really a financial point. Resolution is too late. If you want to have bail-in, we have instrument to have bail-in before default, they call COCO. Well, this is what we learn. We learn the supervisors don't like bail-in either. 
they hate to ever, ever suggest to investors that it would have to bear losses. I don't know if you remember the Deutsche Bank uh, problem when they suddenly discovered that they couldn't, according to the law, pay a coupon to their cocoa holders. I mean, that's not exactly a big bail-in stuff. It's just part of the preventive mechanism. I think it's more important work on the prevention that hope to get the resolution in perfect shape. Well, they refuse to, because no one really wants to inflict pain on investors, politicians don't, and regulators. So I think resolution is always going to be messy.